Candice Fox Friesen with Investor Smarts Money and the Entrepreneurial Spirit podcast. And today we have Angel Lateral with us. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you. And uh, we've got an interesting topic that a lot of times people don't talk about or they kind of avoid or, you know, life's always busy. Um, but it's an important one in talking about uh, estates and planning. So really good topic for entrepreneurs, I think, especially because we have to really pay attention to those things more than somebody who's maybe employed and doesn't have to worry about it as much, maybe because they've got a great pension from work and, um, and maybe just don't really think about estate planning as much. But uh, mm -hmm. as you've got a business, it's so much more involved, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are right now in your current business. Yeah, it's uh, it was definitely an entrepreneurial journey. Uh, I, I spent a good, uh, well, after law school, I went right into law firms and I never uh, fit in there. And I actually started out as a litigation attorney doing complex litigation. Um, I, I thought I loved litigation because it's kind of like a chess match. It's very uh, strategic. Uh, I was fighting the good fight uh, here in the U.S. We were going, I was doing class action litigation uh, from the uh, plaintiff side, and we were going after nasty corporations that were taking advantage of, of people um, through, like, people with cancer, people, you know, like, we're, multinational corporations doing feedlots. It's like, we were like, let's just take on the bad guy. Uh, but uh, I actually ended up leaving that job because my... Uh, Although I thought my mentor attorney was phenomenal, he was at that time 40 years old, looked like he was about 60, never saw his family. Yeah. And I was like, wow, uh, this is uh, this is a path like where you you really aren't ever gonna have a life. You're just gonna yeah. you're just gonna work. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. So I actually was like, well, this law firm from my hometown recruited me. And I was like, I'll go there and I'll just do regional law, like business law, and maybe dabble in some litigation, some estate planning. And I tried that on and realized that, oh my goodness, like attorneys are kind of miserable no matter where you go. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so much about the billable hour. Uh, they didn't want to solve people's problems. They just literally wanted people to come into the firm, sign up for something that the senior partner said they needed and for us to be billing them $350, $400 an hour for you know, maybe an estate plan, maybe for uh, some type of business situation or telling them it's a slam dunk in litigation. And then they'd come to me, assigned to me. And I was like, oh, let's talk about what, what was the situation. And like me, I really became an attorney to help people and to solve people's problems, not to just give them documents. And my experience in that law firm, uh, I kept, <laughs> the law firm got mad at me because I kept in their view, losing them clients. But what I would do is I talk to the people, I'd counsel them and realize I'm like, you don't need a lawyer for this right now. I'm like, if don't sue your neighbor, uh, like make them a pie, go yeah. talk to them. Uh, right. Or I'm like, for, for business purposes, I'm like, no, that would be a horrible idea to sue. Why don't you just work it out? And I constantly get people uh, <laughs> essentially to back up and solve, we'd solve their problem and they'd be very satisfied. And I think it built trust with the law firm However, uh, they didn't get the billable hours at that moment in time uh, for the client. And so eventually me and that law firm actually got a little, like it was called a divorce settlement. They said, we're going to pay you and you don't come back. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and that, at that point in my life, it's pretty much a young attorney. I, I knew I didn't fit in in the law firm life. I really wasn't trying to become senior partner. I was, I was there to help people and uh, they were there to keep their, their cherry desks and the, the lights on and their stodgy reputation. And what I actually witnessed in that time was a lot of people, because I, I I've always been interested in estate planning. It just, it seems like a worthy endeavor to be like, I'd yeah. be thinking about everybody dies. Like, let's make sure we actually build it so that you're creating connection for your family after that death. Like, um, and really just thinking about it. So it becomes a smooth transition because people get weird when there's a death. Yep. And I always be interested in how do we prevent the weirdness, like through the means that we have as counselors and as attorneys. 
And right. so when I watched that stodgy old law firm do estate planning for people, I also realized there was something wrong with the traditional way of estate planning, which is mm -hmm. literally here's some formulaic documents that we decided as attorneys you need. Uh, and they, they, in a lot of cases, don't actually work for families. And that happened to my family. Actually, that stodgy law firm did the plan for my mother's um, uh, parents and we had a family cabin. They decided in poor man's estate planning, we're just gonna divide the cabin amongst the five kids, tenants in common. It'll allow the elderlies to get Medicare and Medicaid, all the things, like all the government benefits they need because they were, were of lower income, but then they won't have assets in their name. And then they eventually passed and then the kids are co-owning this cabin, um, which, in the long run, because none of the, they didn't know the family dynamic, which was not, like everybody wasn't on the same page as far as the goals of the cabin. Yeah. Not everybody had planning in place, uh, like wills or, or trusts. And so when my oldest uncle died, it just blew up into this giant, like huge icky yeah. mess. And they don't speak anymore, you know? And so the seeds of destruction were all around this, the assumption that this was the best thing for the family to put it in all mm -hmm. five children's name. And that isn't always, you know, like maybe in some Usually. families that would be okay, but it's really a seed for a future conflict that's planted at that point in time versus looking and taking the family dynamic into consideration and building a, a plan that's unique, that's going to meet that family's needs long-term and also making sure all the kids in the family have planning. And so, yeah. Um, th that was a big eye opener for me about, you know, how just the traditional way of attorneys tell you what to do uh, wasn't the way to go. So yeah, how I got to where I am today, one from having that experience in that law firm, I actually moved to the West Coast of the United States thinking attorneys were different out there. Um, found myself facing law firms of similar cultures, similar groups of miserable people. And uh, so I was like, maybe I need to not be a lawyer for a minute. And I ended up taking an alternative legal job for the Seattle Children's Hospital, where I worked for 15 years cool. as a project manager and also supporting human subjects protection research um, at, in a, as a uh, non-medical advisor to this panel saying, you know, this is ethical research for kiddos. Uh, which was a great experience, uh, but I eventually still wanted to come back to doing law. And I have a very entrepreneurial spirit. I was never meant to have a boss tell me what to do. Yeah. And I never got promoted in corporate because I have an opinion and I share it and I don't play politics. And I was, <laughs> so uh, we eventually reached a head where they're like, you don't feel like you're committed to your job. And I was like, well, I'm extremely committed to my job, but I don't think you guys are committed to me. So I'm going to yeah. just go my own way. Uh, and uh, that's what caused me to launch. Like, you know, I came full circle to be like, well, let me not work for somebody. Let me use my law degree to do what I desire to do, which is help people as my own business and like yeah. just take the entrepreneurial leap. Uh, so I actually launched two and a half businesses at the same time. I launched into a consulting role as a project manager. I had that piece from corporate, I launched my solo law practice uh, in both estate planning and landlord tenant in 2020. And then I, I launched my practice as a, as a spiritual advisor guide, uh, you know, abundance mindset coach, uh, all at the same time, which people thought I was crazy. And then COVID hit and shut everything down. <laughs> and so, um, which was actually a blessing. Uh, for my, so I could focus really in on systems for my business and invest the time and energy I needed to really become the best estate planning attorney I possibly could. So uh, that's what brings me to me being a solo practitioner focused specifically on estate planning. I'm, I'm trained in a, what's called the new law business model way, which is about thinking from problem solving abundance approach where I'm a counselor for people's families for life and not just a document producer. Uh, I only charge flat rate and it is about the coaching and meeting people's objectives, yeah. not about paperwork, uh, essentially. Yeah. How do we create the best container for abundance for that family through the thought of thinking about, you know, like, like yeah. and, and protecting their business, thinking about if you die or if you're incapacitated, yeah. what do we need to do to ensure everyone's taken care of, that your business either closes or passes appropriately uh, with all of the details and legal details. How do we save your family from 
the bureaucratic torture chamber that is the probate system uh, right. in, the, in the United States, particularly, um, as well as, you know, banks and other, like the, the state, there's, there's so many obstacles that if you don't have a plan, uh, your family members are going to experience and uh, not, and also have to be grieving you. So like, yeah. what, a, yeah. what a horrible thing. So Yeah. <coughs> That's what I was going to say, you know, and, and people don't always think about the incap incapacitated part. They just think about, oh, when I die, but mm -hmm. any of us could be in an accident tomorrow on the road and we're still around, but we're not able to run the business maybe ever again. Right. Right. Um, so it's all these things that people try to avoid and don't really love to talk about, but they're so important. Mm hmm. And again, you know, it's it's having somebody facilitate the conversations that I think is key, because number one, we don't really want to talk about it. And second, you know, there's these conflicts where how do you ever finally just arrive at a solution, right? It tends to just be checkmate. We, we both don't have, you know, we both have opposite opinions, so we'll just not talk about this anymore. Mm -hmm. so just finally be able to get through to a decision. Mm -hmm. And one of my taglines with um, when I when I put my marketing out there to get people to at least come to a webinar or just to just to think about it, it's like baby steps, right? Like, I, yeah. but I'm like everybody, you know, everybody dies, so uh, you know that's the one thing we can depend on. And it's never too early to plan, but it can always be too late. It really is, especially for business owners and entrepreneurs, where because we're often the engine of our business, right? So if we were incapacitated. Um, and say you get better from that incapacitation, right? But how does your business continue without you if you don't have a plan? Yeah. Like, so, you know, maybe you, you wake up from that coma or whatever happens, but if you're, if you weren't there and you had no plan for someone to carry it out while you're incapacitated, uh, then there's nothing for you to come back to. There's just ruins and you have to rebuild yeah. on top of rebuilding your health. If, if, if you do come back from a situation of incapacitation. Yeah. And at that point, there's no bank who's like, oh, I'd love to lend you money right now. But no, maybe, they don't care. No, <laughs> it's all those things too, right? Having a line of credit sitting there if you don't have the cash, but as an emergency fund, but having a line of credit available before you need it, right? Even if it's mm -hmm. just sitting there. There's so many mm -hmm. little things, like you said, yeah and ensuring that you have the right powers of attorney and that they're, uh, uh, you know, both the people to be the powers of attorney, but that the power of attorney document is serving you in such a way as that people can access your accounts uh, while you're incapacitated because banks are uh, a number one problematic, uh, which it's a good thing. Like they don't let anybody just wander up and touch right. your money, but they literally don't let anybody wander up and touch your money, even if they might have some documentation that says they're an authorized person. If you don't have the right power of attorney, they're like, nope, not happening. Yeah. Uh, you have no ability to do that. And then if the power of attorney doesn't have the ability to manage certain assets or, or, or change things, they, they, even if they have the power of attorney and can access your bank account, they might not be able to do the things you need them to do to keep your business going. Yeah. Uh, for your capacity. So we really have to think about what are all of the pieces for your business of in case of capacity or secession planning that we need, uh, you know, the roles and responsibilities outlined, who will take over yeah. and do the things that <coughs> I can't do them. Yeah. So do you find a lot of parents are, you know, if you think that your kids are going to be squabbling, your adult parent, uh, your adult children, are there a lot of parents that just completely avoid it? You know, what? once I die, they'll just figure this out. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of um, there's a big perception that if you're a young family and you have minor kids that you're really too young for estate planning, or if, you know, if you're the average middle class American, and I'm just going to assume in Canada that like if you're living paycheck to paycheck, which so many people are, uh, even if you've got your own home, for example, and you've got young kids yeah. that you don't need to estate plan because you don't have an estate. Like there's, there's right. no thing for people to take. But for young families with minor kids, uh, estate planning is so important because of the, both the, the long-term and temporary guardianship planning, mm -hmm. but also to ensure that your minor children, if they lose both their parents, or if you're a single parent and they lose you, um, 
are, are actually taken care of because kids cannot inherit property or money. Uh, there has to be a custodian in place to manage that for them. Mm -hmm. And um, custodians can just do whatever <laughs> with it. So, uh, a, you know, a lot of kids have been left both destitute or in, or in the hands of the state uh, you know, with, without the right temporary guardianship thing in place when they lose their parents. Um, and then on top, or people lose what little you are able to give them. And so through custom estate planning, we can make sure we have emergency planning in place so that your kids don't get taken by the state if both parents or if they, if they can't find the other parent, like that happens because you, you get in a car accident. If you don't have things in your wallet or purse that say, these are the people to call, I have a kid. Why would the first responders know that there's yeah. a child at home with a babysitter or, or not, right? Right. Um, we need the emergency planning in place. Then who are the temporary guardians? Because it's not people, your kids cannot be with anyone but next of kin. They have to be blood relatives to be temporary guardians, unless you have the right paperwork in place that says these people are, uh, you know, you know, signed and dated. These people can be the yeah. temporary guardians of these kids. And, and they, you want them to be nearby. <laughs> exactly. So you want that plan. And then you want, okay, now if I, if I die, like who's got them long-term and under what conditions, right? Like yeah. you might like them with uncle, um, uh, uncle Sam and, uh, and aunt Sally, but only if it's uncle Sam and aunt Sally, right? What if they get a divorce? Like you know, there's, no, no. Or, or, like um, yeah. yeah. So there's that planning, but then, and then there's the way of how do we manage the assets that you're going to pass? Like, oh, well, you can't just assume that they're going to be able to have the house because mm -hmm. they're minors who's going to take care of the house. Uh, so, so passing things in trust uh, can both ensure that you have a trustee who can manage the property or sell the property so the kids have money in a nest egg, but mm -hmm. then they receive in trust. So then the, it's not the guardian's um, ability to lo lose it uh, on their behalf, but a, a trustee is watching over it. Yeah. So it's there for them throughout their life to support them for their well-being, their care, their education. Mm -hmm. um, and then when they turn 18, they don't just automatically get it and then blow it as our 18 year olds um, will do. Yeah. <laughs> who, who was yeah. great with money at 18? Yeah. I sure as well wasn't. Like, yeah. so, um, and, then, and then they can grow that over time. So even if it's the littlest nest egg, it's, it's something that you can leave to them for future generations so that they won't be in a, in a place. So yeah. that's my soapbox for younger families because there's just so much ugly stuff that could happen to younger kids and so much that can be taken advantage of yeah. uh, in the process. And it's all done through court systems. Uh, as opposed to a kind of more of warm and fuzzy, like it's already taken care of uh, yeah. approach. But then, yeah, for people with adult children, they're just like, well, I don't want to talk about it because you don't want to think about your own mortality. Yeah. You also think, oh, they'll figure it out or I've got things written down and they'll follow my wishes after I'm gone. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just on the phone with a woman today and her parents thought that was the case, but her brother turned into like, you know, just a very snarky, evil person. The moment dad passed away, yeah. uh, sold all dad's stuff, took and like, is now taking his sister to court for the trust. Like, cause he had literally tried to go into the bank and take all the money. And the bank's like, no, you can't take all the money. There's, this is a trust and you have five siblings. Like, <laughs> and yeah. parents had no idea that was coming and nor did sister. It's just like, all of a sudden they're both dead. And now he's, turned into this selfish, evil, I'm taking all the things and taking us all to court. Like, what do I do? Yeah. I was like, one, I'm sorry. Two, people get really weird when people die. And so we can't assume the best intent when people are grieving for whatever reason, it's that, you know, gasoline on a uh, smoldering fire that makes things like yeah. literally ex explode in some family dynamics and sometimes completely out of the blue. Yeah. Uh, this woman's case, nobody expected their brother to react the way he has. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, thank God their family had a trust, though it appears the trust wasn't communicated out well enough because I was like, do you have, you know who the trustee is? Do you have the paperwork? She's like, no, I, I don't have anything. I just know it exists because the bank told me so. And then I'm getting this document from the federal court saying, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, 
Okay. Well, yeah. Um, so part of planning is also the communication uh, uh, aspect of it. Not only yeah. do we want to do the planning, but communicate. This is my wishes. This is how it's going to be taken care of. These are the people to contact. Uh, that's part of sowing the seeds of, of connection as opposed to future conflict with the communication piece around it. We yeah. want to say gone are the days of we do a will and um, we hide it with the lawyer. We don't tell anybody, you know, what our wishes are until after I'm gone. And there's some big reveal. Uh, that, that's, that's not a recipe <laughs> for uh, positive connection for the family long-term. Like the, yeah. the recipe is let's, let's do really good custom planning based on our family dynamic, communicate what we're doing yeah. um, while we're alive, uh, such that when we're not alive and it's too late for us to communicate, uh, it'll all work out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and you know, so again, businesses, uh, family cabins, like you mentioned, um, farms. I live in a rural area, so farms can be a big transfer as well of wealth. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I would say maybe 30, 40 years ago, it was like, well, pass on the farm to the oldest boy, and the rest will get married and figure it out, right? And it's just not like that anymore. And so you have things like insurance that kind of help make that whole process happen so that the one person who gets the farm not um, that still have to pay out the other four kids, let's say, uh, that that whole thing can happen, right? And they're not suddenly strapped with this farm and thousands or millions of dollars of debt. So um, do you in general recommend life insurance for people? Is it more to help them when it's a bigger asset like that to pay out the other siblings? Um, again, the average family with no assets, as you said, you know, is kind of paycheck to paycheck. Are you still recommending that they would get some insurance? Um, what does that sort of look like? Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're a business owner. So I myself, I have a, I have a chihuahua. I have no kids. I am, you know, my partner, he has four children. Uh, we're not married yet. So they're not, you know, my responsibility, but I still have a million dollar life insurance policy. It primarily because if I was to die, there needs to be money to take care of the business and close it up or transfer it. Um, so I'm not leaving people with debt and other messes. And honestly, if they lose me young, I also want there to be uh, means that I can take care of my parents' mortgage, give them, you know, like other yeah, things yeah. that if they lose me, at least there's compensation. Yeah. Um, but, but primarily because of that business. So, uh, and especially so if you are, a uh, young family with minor kids living paycheck to paycheck, life insurance is so important because that's going to ensure there's, if they lose both of you, that the, the kids have something to take care of them. Yeah. Uh, and it's not that expensive to get term life insurance, which in some ways is a gamble when you're younger because like it'll end. And then whatever your monthly premium is, is, is gone if, yeah. the, if the term ends. Uh, but you can get really reasonable term life insurance if you're in your 30s or 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, once you're in your 50s, it's a little too late. So, um, but so for your average family that doesn't have a lot of expendable income, investing in a t term life insurance policy is really essential for both the mom and the dad. If the, if you've got the or yeah. the mom and the mom, <laughs> but if if you've got a two income household, both folks, or even if it's a one income household, because if you were to lose the primary caregiver. Uh, then, uh, you know, dad or mom, whoever is the, the wage earner is going to need to replace that labor uh, yeah. with nannies or, you know, uh, daycare, which is really, really expensive. Uh, it's so, yeah, it's hugely important to have life insurance. And if you're older and have our businesses that are risky or otherwise, um, multiple types of life insurance is recommended, but whole life insurance, which a lot of people don't realize is different than term life, right? Whole life insurance, uh, you, the, the death benefit is lower and often the premium is higher. However, uh, you get cash value for the investment in the life insurance and it never goes away. Yeah. So you can actually use it as both a retirement planning mechanism, uh, especially if you're self-employed, like yeah, yeah. saving for retirement is often a, a scary dream. So <laughs> Doing whole life investment uh, is good because then you have that nest egg of that cash value that's building, 
you also, once you build up the cash value of the whole life, can actually take loans from yourself with the right. from the cash value. Then you're paying yourself back with interest versus versus paying a bank back with interest for that loan. So you're investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. So although the death benefits lower, like you're really it's an investment is a way to look at it. And anyone who has like farms and generational businesses, uh, even if you're older, I would say should definitely it's worthwhile getting whole life so that you have that investment bank account essentially that you can draw from. Yeah. Uh, so you you have cash if you need it to support your business yeah and you're taking a loan from yourself as opposed to again a bank which may or may not give to um pennies worth of, of you know they might not look at you as a good investment so uh, the whole yeah. life is a is a definitely a nest egg building mechanism uh, that's helpful and if you're a younger family or a family with business i i think having a portfolio where you have both term life insurance and whole life is is a good idea yeah and as much as they'll give you for a reasonable amount, take it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think like, like you're saying, you know, you can have different products. So maybe, you know, the kids you plan that they'll be dependent until they're, let's say 20 or 22, whatever that number is for yourself, but um, they're dependent until let's say 22, they're living at home still. Okay. Maybe at 22, that term insurance is done, but then I've got the whole life that's doing something else for me. Like you said, mm -hmm. it's not only the death benefit, there's um, you know, if you're, if you're asked, if you um, if your business doesn't sell and you don't retire on that money, um, but you pass away, then maybe your business isn't worth as much, but at least then your significant other can live off that life insurance instead. Right. The value of a business could suddenly drop when you're not there if you're the business. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, especially if you've got a family that's based on self employment, like self-employed, yeah. self-entrepreneurial uh, income. Yeah. It's so essential to have the life insurance there because there, there is no pension. There is no, like, there's yeah. no safety net other than the one you create. Yeah. Um, so yeah, very essential. Also, the great thing about whole life is you can insure your kids uh, as well. So you can buy whole life policies for them, which could become theirs at a certain age right and again there's cash value in those so you're uh maybe they use it for education you know it's it's a it's an asset for yeah. them uh that can be passed along um yeah back to them uh so that they have that and it's a great example you're setting financially about making investments and using these tools and products that are out there for us yeah and I think that's that's the big difference um, between the wealthy, you know, and people who are living paycheck to paycheck is they're thinking generationally, right? They're not just thinking about today and, okay, how am I going to make today work? And I just got to get till Friday. But when you can get past that day-to-day, -day, I don't want to call it struggle, but, you know, focus, we'll say, um, that's where you can start thinking bigger than, than where you're at, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, wealthy people, they, the grandparents pass on kid, the money to the grandkids, right? They're skipping generations and allowing that money to really grow. So, um, but it starts with somebody. It always starts yeah. with one generation to be focused on more than just, you know, what we're doing today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the foundation to, when I do abundance mindset coaching for people, I'm not trying to shove sunshine uh, into places where it be like, just, just think, you know, and it'll happen. It's, yeah. it's abundance mindset is about honestly looking at life as a creative force. And so how do we create? Well, we first need a container uh, for creation. Like that's how babies are born, right? There's this sperm in a womb and the container where it becomes a new life is where the, it's formed. And um, when we look at legal things, both businesses, like legal entities are containers for creation and, yeah. and thus abundance, trusts and using those as containers for abundance to for next generations or even this generation are a container. Uh, and things like life insurance policies are in fact containers uh, as well. And then they can go from one container to another, which is why you, you have trusts so that you could name the trust as the beneficiary for the life insurance. Uh, so things are handled neatly outside of court and probate too um, for all of that. So part of that, like it, it has to start with someone saying, I'm going to 
think about things more from, you know, for, for the future yeah. and from a creator standpoint, as opposed to a reactionary standpoint, you know, it's, yeah. it's hard to get yourself out of paycheck to paycheck mentality. Um, because you're, you are, when you're in paycheck to paycheck and you're depending on another or even your next client to pay you, right. You're, you're in reaction mode. Yeah. Uh, so it is hard to build a new thing, but if you can even just get a spark of, well, what do I do to build? Like, yeah. and then start thinking about it from a creator, from a the self-starter, from, you know, taking that ability to respond mm-hmm. uh, and the responsibility for your future and your family's future, and then you can really start to build. And it, it doesn't yeah. take, it doesn't take much. And families of moderate means in some ways have all the more, there's all the more value in thinking like what you, what people dismiss is only for the wealthy. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I want to see more families that do live paycheck to paycheck have trusts because what little they have to protect is so essential uh, for that next generation. And that tool of the trust, uh, especially if they get a nice life insurance policy, even if it's term, like if they need it, it's going to serve that family so well and actually get them out of uh, the place where they feel like they're the have nots and become the haves. Yeah. Uh, first, it changes. It's first the mindset honestly, yeah. of I'm able to create this. Mm-hmm. But it's also, you know, I, I, I value the next generation more than I value going to have a, going to the party on Saturday, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can't do it all, right? There, there always has to be give and take, right? So if you, um, or delayed gratification, really, that's what a lot yeah. of it is. Yeah. So to say, you know what, okay, I'm going to give up going out I'm going to give up maybe a family trip to invest in my retirement invest in estate planning and looking at the future Mm -hmm. generations um, instead of just this life that we have right in front of us right right and it really is like if you have a family trip for a family like say you're going to take a cruise which is going to cost you three to five thousand dollars you, you can have a really nice trust plan for three to five thousand dollars or, uh, you know, or I'm going to invest in term life and we, our budget's really thin. Uh, so that 70 bucks a month. OK, where can we save 70 bucks a month on, on superfluous things yeah. uh, so that we can channel that 70 dollars to ensuring we have this this nest egg if, uh, you know, if I were to not be here? Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely give and take, definitely delayed gratification, or in the case of life insurance, you're making an investment in something you won't get to spend ever, you know, my million dollars, I'm like, yeah, like my family's going to be set, but they're not going to have me. Um, so it's, <laughs> so yeah. we're like, you're spending $70 a month on that, which I am. And I'm like, yes. And it's totally worth it to me that if, um, that ensures that um, if I'm not here, I'm not leaving someone a mess. Yeah. And if I do leave a mess, they're going to have the financial abundance to clean it up. (laughs) That's so important. I love it. Um, So then um, I guess moving on to what you were talking a little bit about, um, which I think is fantastic, is being that advisor throughout somebody's life. So are they coming, are people coming back to you kind of every year or two, every three years, Mm -hmm. sort of reevaluate everything and related to sort of your comment about the cabin and how everyone's kind of have to figure out these pieces, otherwise it might not work so well when the first person passes away. But are you then working with the kids of these people too, to say like, this is what mom's plan means for you. And let's make sure that you can kind of continue this again for your kids Mm -hmm. or or what is this going to look like for your life, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the approach as I've been trained and as I do in my practice is, uh, well, it's it's unique to a, at least a network here in the U.S. of about 450, and I, I believe there are actually a number of us up in Canada as well. But the, you know, we we hope that we can proselytize this approach for all families to have attorneys that are looking at things from a holistic. So we we start the plan from a really customized, making sure folks do a full asset inventory of both their physical assets, their monetary assets, but also their spiritual, educational, and family assets. Like, who is your network? Who are your people? What are the things besides money and stuff uh, that you would be leaving behind? 
um, so that we know, like, and then we have a conversation in the first session, which I call life and legacy planning session. Um, some of my colleagues call it a family wealth plan planning session. Yeah. Um, but since I work with a lot of business owners, I like to use the life and legacy because we're really planning for life, not yeah. just so much death. Uh, and uh, yeah, and not so much for necessarily just wealth preservation, uh, so much as wealth growing. Mm-hmm. So, um, so we, we look at that custom dynamic, we really get to know what's going on with the family so that when we make the initial design and plan, we're taking that all into account. Then as we move forward and we've got a plan in place, that's where um, I highly encourage and will facilitate if they want me to a family meeting, um, but the, the communication, so everyone actually knows what the plan is. Um, who to contact, i.e. me, if they need coaching, if, if, uh, if the plan has to go into play. Yeah. Uh, and that, yeah, that everybody understands and, and has the knowledge, the ability and the comfort to say these, um, okay, this is my role, my responsibility, this is who I call, and this is, this is what's gonna happen. And so, yeah, I definitely will facilitate family meetings uh, for people if that's needed or wanted. Uh, not in all cases is it needed or wanted, but yeah. the, I am uh, encouraging and uh, ensuring that those communications are happening around the family because gone are the days of hiding what it is, but the plan only works if the plan is communicated. Yeah. <laughs> so th- th- that, that, that is so essential to a functional plan is yeah. that communication really piece is. that everyone understands what the plan is what happens and how it works um, on the other side. And then, yes, once we do folks documents, have that plan have that communication, make sure if they've created trust plans that we funded it, make sure if they have a business, we have the succession planning in place and we've got it in some type of format that it's accessible to both the uh, professional executor and uh, as well as the successor trustee. So we've got people who know who to talk to and are working together and where to find the practical stuff and the things uh, if someone was to be incapacitated or dead because that's not in the legal documents, but you need to have a plan um, yeah. as well in place that says, this is where you go to close my Google workspace yeah. <laughs> um, among other things, right? So we've yeah. got all that in place, but then we revisit that. I either have people that join what I call membership and they pay me an annual fee that's very reasonable, but we look at everything annually because they have such flux and change in their family dynamic or their assets that it's worth, okay, let's just do an assessment every year. Um, And uh, if they have to make major changes every year, there would be, um, then we make those changes. Um, Most families, it's worth a check-in every three years. And, you know, regardless if they call me, I'm calling them every three years and we're going to do that assessment check-in and make sure um, that we've refreshed whatever powers of attorneys we need to do. Because banks uh, in my state of the United States, Washington, don't like powers of attorneys that are over three years old. So I recommend we refresh those every three years, um, at least for the financial ones so that the banks don't get weird (laughs) and leave somebody being like, what? I thought I thought I had everything I needed. Um, We definitely refresh those every three years. And then we look at, yeah, the asset inventories and again, the family dynamic. And we say, is this still what you want to have in place? Yeah. You know, frequently people grow and evolve in a three-year time. And maybe they don't change their trust terms, but they're like, well, I wanted to be cremated, but now there's this thing called green burial and I'm going to do that. And, um, you know, I've changed my philosophical views. So we're not going to have a funeral, blah, blah, blah. You know, so they'll make changes to things like that. Or maybe they bought a house and we want to make sure that's on the asset inventory, or maybe they have invested in five more life insurance policies or something, you know, or long-term care insurance. And we make sure that's in the inventory and we just keep everything up to date. Yeah, well, and again, we don't want to say that there's going to be separation, but obviously that happens too. separation or somebody passes away and you come into money. And now Mm -hmm. you look at things and everything's changed again. So I think it's just, yeah, it's good practice just to review it, even if you think nothing's changed. Even if all of us just think back three years, a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because again, this is life planning. Yes, it is the plan for your death and incapacity, but we are all alive. And so while we're alive, we are living dynamic lives and things change. So yeah, uh, estate planning is never one and done. You want to yeah. look at it at a minimum every three years and yeah. make sure it reflects your life uh, yeah. so that it doesn't grow so out of date that when the time comes, it again doesn't work for you. Even if on point one, it was the best plan ever, if it's 10 years old and you haven't looked at it in 10 years, it's probably no longer the best plan ever. Yeah. Yeah. And the one thing that I like to recommend for people just doing the money coaching piece of it is to have, like, I call it a life binder and something where everything is in one place at home. Mm -hmm. So people know, maybe they're not talking to you about sort of more the day-to-day -day stuff, right? But just within partners, usually one person kind of handles the money, the other person doesn't, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Just where to even start to find a lot of the things. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you recommend sort of that within a family household, let's say, versus sort of the bigger planning uh, that's done estate-wise, I guess, for an overall family? Yeah, absolutely. I recommend everyone has essentially an Excel sheet that's an inventory. Um, yeah. You know, you choose your software package, but it's an inventory where you literally have a list of here's the bank accounts, here's the property, here's the investment accounts down, here's my cryptocurrency, here's my, you know, whatever odd stuff, here's the big ticket items as far yeah. as a property. So that's the stuff that has monetary huge value. Then I also recommend, especially with people that are collectors of, art or cultural artifacts or just they have they have a lot of things that have personal um, value but really maybe not a lot of financial value that uh, might end up at goodwill yeah. <laughs> like if, if people don't know is that you have a another inventory and you can get really detailed with those with pictures and things so that that's clear uh, with those kind of non-monetary assets that we've got that and then you have the things that are the practical household stuff which you want in that life binder um, and there's actually software as service now available. Everplans.com is one of them, um, where it's like death planning, like turned into wedding planning. So you can you have a uh, you know you can save passwords. You can create a manual for your house. Like yeah, uh, all the things you don't think about that someone won't know if you're not able to tell them. Uh, Everplans kind of prompts you to do, but that life binder should be, you know, like whether you, whatever you call it, in case I get hit by a bus, like yeah. or the oh shit, like <laughs> now what? It's like, yeah. um, you know, what's the password to your phone? Like exactly. who are your deputies that know how to get into your phone in case of your incapacity? You know, you should at least have two of those people. Yeah. And uh, whatever form that binder takes, uh, yeah, it should be a folder even an envelope, at least you've got a list of where to find the things and mm. how to find the things the, the, both the practical day-to-day -day, uh, running my life password, totally recommend password keepers, but still yeah. someone's going to need to know the password to your password keeper yeah, exactly. and still the password to your phone. <laughs> like, like there's so, there's so many passwords in life, right? Yeah. I think I have between my team of people who help me, we have like seven pages of passwords or something ridiculous. You know what I mean? And yeah, just day to day, you don't think about it. But when you actually have to start writing this stuff down, it's like, whoa, you know, there's so many things you just, like you said, you just kind of do. Um, and then for, for, I'll just be kind of sexist, but you know, for the women who maybe never take care of the house, you know, I had one lady, she's like, I didn't know I had to change the HRV filter and where mm -hmm. even is this thing, you know? And I was just yeah. chatting with her about, you know, over coffee and it came up and I was like, well, we're in your house. So let's go to the crawl space and, and we'll do that. Right. But, um, but it, you know, there's this frustration of like, I never had to do this. I never had to worry about this stuff. And now I do. Right. So, yeah. yeah. yeah and that's huge. That's where the user manual for the house, actually, when I was reading the um there's a book it's called if i get hit by a bus that the the founders of everplans wrote and i i i i'm a nerd i read things about people dying and being incapacitated all the time so i'm like what's this crazy new product but yeah. it didn't even occur to me i'm a i'm a renter i've been a landlord tenant attorney but like a, a user manual for the house and i was like oh that makes total sense because actually my house that i rent came with one it's got all the user yeah. manuals in a binder and and do this, do that. It's a complicated, new, environmentally friendly house. 
Yeah. Uh, but I'm like, but in a family where one or the other always does the thing, um, yeah. if you lose the person who always does the thing, the person who's still there doesn't know yeah. how to take care of the furnace, the dishwasher, um, you know, doesn't know that the dog goes to the vet in May. Like, yeah. you know, doesn't know like all of the things that when you have a, yeah, like couples with different roles, yeah, you need to communicate and have in that uh, family binder what all those things are in case mm -hmm. one of the other of you is lost. Yeah. Um, yeah. The house user manual was one that I was like, oh, that's brilliant. Because yeah, there's so many things, especially if you own your own house that someone's not going to know. Yeah. Or this is even just where I buy the things that we need, right? Like the furnace mm -hmm. or this or that. And yeah. And again, I think it's, it, these kinds of things usually hit you maybe after a year because you're just in that fog of losing the person that you're not thinking about all this stuff. And then suddenly it's like, wait a minute, I probably have to fix something or do something on this house. <laughs> right. <laughs> or it's a big problem that you could have avoided by that maintenance kind of stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And where did they put that? You know, and uh, I know when my grandfather died, he was a, he was a tinkerer and his uh, garage was just a special place uh, to sort out with the family. But I, I <laughs> and then we, they had this antique collection uh, as well, but there was, you know, so many things that had never been like assessed or looked at and things. And yeah. so I always think back on that because I'm, I'm certain there were probably things that like yeah. should have been like antiques roadshow level of right. like go go deal with this that were just ah you know it was just too much uh, to yeah. deal with. But if it, you know if he had had some kind of inventory that was like you know I got this thing at such and such place and it's right. I think worth this or you know crazy collectors will love this. Yeah, uh, it could have been a little bit of a more of a roadmap for us so that we didn't just throw things away because on its face it's like, mm, like yeah. What this looks like junk yeah but yeah <laughs> probably wasn't like oh no, i know maybe it was <laughs> Who knows? yeah and if everybody in the family thinks it is then it's nobody's treasure and yet it's it's going to be treasure for somebody out there because it is worth something right yeah and yeah. i'm actually working with this family right now and the parents have an art collection that's quite extensive but their daughter who i've also worked she's like i hate their art collection if they die and they haven't dealt with it it's all going to goodwill and i was like yeah. <laughs> so I was like okay uh like I was like and I was like have you guys been in communication she's like yes I've been very clear to my parents and so like working with mom I was like we're gonna need uh an artistic power of attorney like someone who like is the like someone you've designated to manage the art collection because get, if, get if them in the daughters, house yeah the daughter's the successor trustee she's just getting rid of it all yeah <laughs> So yeah, we've got a plan in place that the person who will care about art is going to step in and work with her to sell it or rehome it. From yeah, they have very differing views about uh, how to spend their time, exactly. energy, and money. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you one more thing about uh, this this whole thing, and it's probably more the, the emotional piece. But um, are a lot of people, you know, when they get to this point, I think there's also if you've done all those steps, probably you ta are taking this serious enough that you're maybe wanting to write out your life, write out the letters that you would give as kind of your final, you know, advice or stories or whatever to your kids. So are you finding that people do a lot of that too? They don't do it without prompting. Uh, and it is actually part of my process to prompt them uh, so that we're, if we're if, you know, it, at, at a minimum, they leave my planning process, us having done a Zoom call that's recorded, just, just like you know the process here, uh, but where I'm asking, asking them, we're having what I call a priceless conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask them questions, we're gonna capture their laugh, we're gonna capture some stories, we're gonna capture some pieces of their legacy that um, won't be there uh, and if, if we don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so there's at least a digital file out there at a minimum, but with, Families that, especially if you have young kids and if there's a pos, you know, there's always the possibility that we could die in a car accident or something, you know, like in, in that case, I'm like, it would be good to sit down and, you know, do a card for special, uh, and, you know, momentous occasions yeah. in a child's life. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and to do some type of photo collage, to do uh, legacy recordings. And there's actually people that specialize in doing those types of like videos and yeah. recordings. If you want to get fancy, you can get really fancy in capturing your legacy. Yeah. Um, but at a minimum, I say make a plan, um, make a goal, and then just start working on it little by little because yeah. uh, those things are what are really going to be appreciated um, by those you lose. And even if you're older, like my mentor attorney, she tells the story about her dad. And when he died, the only thing she had left of him was a voicemail on her um, cell yeah. phone. And then with something technology that voicemail got deleted and so then there was no record of his voice ever again for right. her and that was it's heart-wrenching you know and she's like I don't want other people to have to go through that so let's you know how hard is it to film a video so you at least have that digital and then you know sh share the digital copy ad nauseum yeah. you know at a, at a minimum so we've got that legacy piece yeah, not sure because people can't frame your will like they don't care and the money yeah. at the end of the day will be great and important and supportive if you're leaving money but what people are really going to miss is you so yeah. how do we leave them pieces of you yeah um, and, um, especially there's a book that my mentor attorney actually wrote called wear clean underwear and it's uh, it's like a choose your own adventure novel that isn't meant to scare parents into planning, but it is definitely, and it comes from the old adage of like, grandma tells you wear clean underwear in case you get you know, hit in car accident or whatever. <laughs> um, but one of the areas is talking about legacy planning and you know, having someone, if you, if you are a young person and you lose your parents very young, but in this story, like she shares about how a mom had left you know, cards and videos for those key momentous occasions yeah. in this child's life and if you know and I think in her story the person loses their mom at age five right so they you wouldn't necessarily re remember your parent oh, with, sure. with, with, with having these videos the cards and other things left for these key times they were still you know, it gets me choked up they were still able to actually have a relationship with their parent even though they weren't with us in the physical and yeah. so um how valuable that would be and yeah it doesn't take that much time and hopefully you don't actually ever need them but if it is the case then yeah you got it and it's so important to make that plan yeah and, and to do it and even if it you know you know it, it could just only take a weekend to really do yeah. the project but um, it, again it, it's it's no i don't know for some people they're very good at it but other people i don't maybe sit down with my daughter and say you know this is what i just really love about you right but when you spend that time doing it, and if you do it again, every year is best or more frequently, but if nothing else, every th three years when they meet with you, hey, what if I really appreciated her since the last time I did a video for her, let's say, right? Because mm -hmm. their characters are changing and, and they're becoming little humans with different interests. And so that right. all changes over time too. So yeah, I think it's awesome. I think that's such a needed piece that again it's easy to put off yeah really easy to put off well, yeah, it's yeah natural we don't want to think about being dead like you yeah. know yeah. we're all gonna live forever oh wait no <laughs> like, it's not I true know. <laughs> so thanks so much for all of this valuable information uh i really appreciate it and i think there's so many great tips in here for people to just really think about uh and hopefully take action on because that's the key piece yeah. just to get it done uh so how do people reach out to you for your services and get this ball rolling yeah absolutely anyone can find me through my website so if you've got the spelling of my name you'll be able to find me or you can just google me angel lateral but my website laterallaw.com uh you can contact me get right on my calendar um and no question's a bad question even if you're not in my physical geography uh, and if I personally can't serve you, I can refer you to someone else. So I just encourage anyone to, to go to my website, book a call with me, and I'll look forward to chatting with you. Anyone can get on there for a 15 minute intake call to talk about your situation, um, mm -hmm. and, and discover, you know, what we need to do to, to get you started in this type of, um, this type of planning. Yeah. So the website's the best way, um, to reach out to me. Yeah, and from my website, you'll find all the other crazy things that I do, um, from being a spiritual guide to uh, um, 
having a podcast and, and uh, a travel blogger, all of that. So you, know, you, can, you can find out all about the other interesting aspects of my personality. <laughs> Just uh, getting people to talk about dying yeah. <laughs> and, and planning for it. So, yeah, so. that's awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and uh, stay in touch. <laughs> Thank you, Candice. Take care.